The first time I really noticed the magical reality of space was when I was 18. I was walking back from the pub to my campsite in the deepest, darkest North Wales. There were no streetlights and no moon, and I happened to look up and I saw this amazing blanket of stars stretching across the night sky, and I realised I was looking at the Milky Way. From that day I was hooked, and I wanted to learn as much as I possibly could about the beautiful nature of space. Over the years I watched countless television documentaries and bought a few books and even read the first few pages of most of them. But I'm not a scientist and I didn't do very well at school in maths and physics. But I always enjoyed the aesthetics of space and the wonderful names astronomers called the phenomena they saw. But I always felt a certain disconnect between stellar nebula, strange sounding galaxies, supernova and high resolution pictures of planets. When I looked up at the night sky, all I could see was the moon and a lot of pretty shining dots. In 1990, I bought a camera with a couple of decent lenses, one of which was a 100 to 300 millimeter super telephoto. For those of you that don't know, a super telephoto just means the lens takes a very narrow angle picture, and this makes the image look magnified. When photographers say millimetres, they're referring to the distance of the objective lens, that's the one at the front, from the focal plane, or where the film used to be, and now the camera's light sensor. This is the way light travels through the lens. It's not about men trying to compensate for their inadequacies, it's just our current level of technology requires lenses to be physically bigger when we want a greater magnification. But as you can see, this lens only measures 220 millimetres, so if anyone can explain this discrepancy, I would be very grateful. I thought it would be ideal to take to the local zoo, but I never considered using it for astronomical observations. But in 2009 I bought a digital camera that took the same lenses as the one that took film. I took this image of the moon and didn't think much more than, that's nice, you can see a lot of the detail there, but I thought I needed a serious telescope with motorised tripod to counteract the rotation of the Earth if I wanted to do any serious space photography. It wasn't until two years later that I felt the urge to try and take some astronomy pictures. But my suspicions were confirmed when all I got were streetlight fogged images and blurred shots of the Pleiades, so I thought I'd go back to Wales where it might be dark enough to capture the Milky Way again. I was disappointed to discover that the streetlights had polluted their skies as much as England, but I managed to take a reasonable picture of the constellation of Orion, where you can see the colours of the different stars. So the next month I tried again in a field near me and used a new app on my iPod Touch called Star Walk. I tried to see if I could see the same stars on the app and learn the name of the different constellations. I knew about Betelgeuse and how it was a red giant that might explode any minute now, but in astronomy terms that means between tomorrow and the next one million years. To its right is Bellatrix, who you might know from Harry Potter, but also Syaf and Rigel at the bottom. Sirius, a binary star with Sirius B, is also known as the Dog Star, which is probably why Sirius Black was given the ability to transform himself into a dog in the Prisoner of Azkaban. But if you look in the middle of Orion, you've got Orion's Belt, which has the stars Alnitak, Alnilam, and Mentaka. Now, Mintaka 3 appeared in an episode of Star Trek The Next Generation called Who Watches the Watchers, where a group of Starfleet anthropologists were studying a village of proto-Vulcans. Captain Picard accidentally showed some primitive Vulcans his 24th century technology and became worshipped as a god. But if you look below Orion's belt, you come to Orion's nebula, which is technically known as M42, or NGC 1976, which is a stellar and planetary nursery 1,344 light years away, spanning 12 light years in radius. This can put off a lot of people about space, because astronomers give these celestial phenomena such boring and technical sounding names. But as with all technical sounding things, there is a simplicity behind it that, when known, breaks down the walls of confusion. Charles Messier was a French astronomer, 1730 to 1817, who wanted to catalogue all the moving and stationary objects in the night sky obviously stationary being a relative term. He made a list of 110 objects, and as it was his list, he got to call them Messier objects, but now they call them M for short. Since then, many of these objects have been identified as galaxies, stellar nebula, and globular clusters. These were put into another list known as the New General Catalogue, hence the abbreviation NGC, of which we are currently up to 7,840. I knew that I was at the limit of my camera and lens, and streetlight pollution and the Earth's rotation would make any kind of long exposure worthless. 
but while on holiday I took another reasonable image of the moon and utilised my camera's live view feature. It can be used as a focusing aid and gives 5 and 10 times digital magnification. I used it to take some pictures of the moon again and every night when it was clear. I would see if I could show the different phases of the moon. One particularly clear night on the 19th of August 2011, I noticed there was a very bright object just below the moon and thought it might be Jupiter. I looked at my Starview app and sure enough Jupiter was there where it was supposed to be. I discovered that focusing on the moon was not as easy as just setting the lens to infinity. I tried the live view feature on Jupiter and to my amazement I could see four small dots around a clear disk of Jupiter. I was in a state of utter elation. These were Jupiter's moons, and I was looking at them with my little lens. I was beside myself with joy. I could barely think straight with ecstasy at the realisation of what I was looking at. These were the Galilean moons, Io, Europa, Ganymede and Callisto, so named after the four wives of Zeus. I was looking at the same objects that Galileo Galilei discovered in January 1610, 402 years ago. I could not sleep with excitement. I looked up a picture of Galileo, and there he was, holding his telescope that he invented from a rumour of one that he heard about, and that it was the same size as my lens. I have another space app called SolarWalk that shows a digital orrery of the solar system. I could see that in Earth's current position, we were still some distance from Jupiter, and would only get closer as the year went on. We would reach opposition in late October, about 391 million miles, or 630 million kilometres away. This was fantastic. Every clear night, with forensic levels of diligence and attention to detail, I would take a picture of Jupiter and track the motion of her moons and make an animation as they travel through their orbits. You may notice the brightness of Jupiter fluctuates. This is probably down to the air pollution and temperature. Also, the angle of the moons changes due to the time of night I took the picture and the 23.5 degree tilt of the Earth's axis. But nevertheless, in some of the pictures you can definitely make out the different sizes of the moons as they reach our position in October. But every clear night, I would know where to look and diligently make my observations. Sometimes it was disappointing when I could see it was clear on the drive home, only to be met with cloud when I got out my camera. But I didn't forget about the moon either. I noticed in September that on two clear nights in succession, the position of the crater known as Tycho had moved. You can see it here as I toggle between the two nights. This is called libration, where the moon wobbles as it orbits the Earth. It's a bit of a worry to think there's an 81,100 million billion billion ton rock, I think that's the way you say it, 238,000 miles away, wobbling all over the place. But it's been doing that for 4.6 billion years, and it's actually moving away from us at 3 centimetres a year. This is slowing the Earth's rotation, and that's why we'll need to add a leap second in July. This night was particularly fascinating as some clouds passed across the face of the moon. I used my live view again and realised that a 300mm lens, when used with an APS-C chip camera, magnifies that image to the equivalent of 480mm. Then a 10 times digital magnification makes that 4800mm. Yes, I know, I'm a nerd. But nerds rule the world these days, so ha! December was a very clear month, with night after night giving excellent seeing, as it's called, which is astronomer talk for a still, clear atmosphere. I could see that I was going to get my first full moon. Every night was showing more and more of the face until... Cloud. Oh well, what do you expect living in the north of England? Still, I thought I could get some nice ethereal shots of the moon, backlighting the clouds. And the very next day? Typical. As January rolled around, there was a nice addition to the skies. Venus appeared in the west. I'm quite pleased with this crescent moon. I tried the live view feature again, and I can't be sure if this is Venus in crescent, or if it's the distorting optics of my lens. We slowly moved away from Jupiter, and soon we'll be catching up with Saturn. I haven't seen it yet, but I know it's 405 million miles, or 651 million kilometres away more than Jupiter. Saturn should become visible in April so I will really be pushing the limits of my lens. If I can't see it, I think I'll have to invest in a proper telescope, because this is something for which I have really acquired a taste, and I would love to see Saturn's rings with my own eyes. In the meantime, I'll gladly learn more constellations. This is Ursa Major, or the Big Dipper, or Big Bear. If you see a reverse question mark in the sky, that's the head of Leo the Lion. 
As you can see, there are a lot of strange-sounding names for most of the visible stars. That's because the scholars who named them were from the Arabian Peninsula more than a thousand years ago, before the rise of Islam. I finally got a decent shot of the Pleiades, or Seven Sisters. This is a group of young blue stars found in the constellation Taurus, just to the right of Orion. This is one of my favourites, showing the Moon, Jupiter and Venus all in one shot. In March 2012, you will be able to cover Jupiter and Venus behind the palm of your hand. In early February, we had a really bad fog across Cheshire. I was feeling really ill and went to bed early. I woke up in the middle of the night and didn't know what to do with myself. I went downstairs to make some cereal. I looked out of the window and thought I'd left my car headlights on, which shouldn't be possible as they have this little alarm. I looked outside and saw the full moon beaming down and lighting up my driveway. I quickly put my boots on and wrapped up as warm as possible and finally took my first full moon. Thank you for watching.